Hey everyone, so in The Great Gatsby, uh, an interesting character, um, Meyer Wolfsheim, right? Based on the real live mobster of Arnold Rothstein, uh, who was called the Brain, who was assassinated in 1928 at the Park Central Hotel, who died at the Stuyvesant uh, Poly Clinic, whose famous last words were when asked, uh, who shot you? And he said, my mother, you stick to your trade, I'll stick to mine. So this guy was known for his bootlegging, his narcotics, of course, uh, Prohibition just made a fortune for guys like Al Capone and Jay Gatsby um, and Arnold Rothstein. He was reputed to also to have fixed the uh, 1919 World Series. And if you know uh, Eight Men Out, uh, the great baseball movie, um, this guy, Joseph Sullivan, was also um, allegedly involved in fixing the World Series. So, the great thing that Fitzgerald does is he grounds his novel so deeply ingrained in the 1920s. So, that's why this novel it, it depicts the 1920s so well. Uh, and he's able to satirize the very thing where he's the king of, which is the amazing thing about Fitzgerald. He, he has two hats, right? He's the, He's the king, he's also the jester, or the fool, who tells the king just how horrible things are and pokes fun of the very people um, who inhabit his book, or his land, let's say, of New York City and uh, Long Island. Um, there's some troubling things about Meyer Wolfsheim, though, and let's take a look at some of these troubling things. Um, Fitzgerald was not above using stereotypes an anti-Semitic caricature that was very popular in the 1920s. Of course, we see in the 19-teens. I mean, it's been around forever, right? Um, unfortunately. And let's take a look at the characterization when we see him in Chapter 4, and he doesn't pop back up until the end, and we'll take a short look at that. Well, you don't n need to know the stereotypes that Borat uses to depict Jews with large noses. Fitzgerald mentions Wolfsheim's nose, I count five times, at least five times. If you add nostrils, maybe six or seven times. He's first described as a small, flat-nosed Jew with a large head, okay, another stereotype, with like shifty eyes. He says tiny eyes, all right? So this is, this is, this is, a, this is a stereotype. But it's a stereotype that readers, of course, would be familiar with in 1925, okay? And then the second time he says he, you know, uh, with his expressive nose, all right? And then we see the violence of Wolfsheim when he says uh, Caspa and he shuts his mouth and this type of description. And then, of course, we know his mob mentality, his mob ties, and if we watch enough, uh, you know, mob movies, when you sit at a restaurant and someone wants to see you, you know, you're going to get shot in a restaurant. And he, he remembers this Rosie Rosenthal who gets shot up at the uh, Metropole and he's all nostalgic, right? And he says, let the bastards come if they want. So then, and then Fitzgerald uses uh, Wolfsheim's nose flashed at me indignantly. I mean, the nose now has become personified, right? And then his nostrils turned to me in an interested way. I mean, think about that. The nostril, the, his, this nose has become so personified. And then the famous oxymoron that he uses is that he eats with a ferocious delicacy. All right, I love to count. I'm going to count one of these days how many oxymorons Fitzgerald actually uses. It has to be, I don't know, I'm going to guess 200 oxymorons. But that's, I'm going to do a, a, you know, a little investigation on that one. But... This guy's a carnivore, so much so that he has human molars as cufflinks, right? I always wanted to come in with human molars and just like scare my students and like, well, where'd you get these? Oh, from my latest victim. You know, it's like, I would never do that. They would be fake molars. Um, but then, you know, he's like, he says, oh, Gatsby is a man of fine breeding, right? The one thing that Gatsby isn't is 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 finely bred right and that's part of the problem he he'll never be gatsby will never be part of 
the West Egg, you know, social class group. You can't buy yourself into that group at all. You got to be bred. And uh, he would never look, he would never so much look at a wife's friend, all right, a friend's wife. Well, that's not actually true because he, he will be looking at someone's wife. It's just not his friend, okay? Um, and then I love what Fitzgerald does here is that both Gatsby and Wolfsheim give like a benediction. Like they raise their hand and they're like the high priests. So there's really no religion in The Great Gatsby. Um, at the end, it comes in a little bit. And of course, T.J. Eckelberg serves as this disembodied god. But the real high priests, the people who are controlling society, see are these gangsters, right? He says, Wolfsheim raised his hand in a sort of benediction, right? And then the fifth time he says, he shook, he shook hands and he turned away his tragic nose. His tragic nose was trembling. Again, more personification of this nose, right? And then he's this uh, denizen, the citizen of Broadway. And Nick is so clueless. He's a, what is he, a dentist? That's a joke, you know, because he's wearing molars as cufflings. And he says, Meyer Wolfsheim? No, he's a gambler. He, he's the man who fixed the World Series. To Fitzgerald, or to, to Nick, or to Gatsby, I'm sorry, it's like, what are you talking about? He, and he says it just so casually. And then he's like, he fixed the World Series? And Nick's like, that staggered me, that I can't believe that such things can happen, right? But we're in New York City, and as Nick tells us, once you pass over the Queensboro Bridge, anything can happen in New York, even Gatsby, All right? So let's take a quick look at the end. I don't want to do any spoilers. So of course, you know, because he's described as a carnivore, of course he has a name of Wolf, right? Does that make sense? I just I just realized that after all these years. I'm like, wow. I'm, I just realized that. All right, so Wolfsheim comes back um, at the end of the book, and he says, you know, did I start him in the business? I made him. Well, really, it was Dan Cody that made him. And if we think of Meyer Wolfsheim as the uglier or nastier version of Dan Cody... Uh, I think that's fair. Like, one was a good father, and one was a bad father. Not that Dan Cody was a good father, but um, we still see the stereotype, right? The nostrils are still quivering. He's holding up two bulbous fingers. And then he says, I never get mixed up when things happen. Let us show our gratitude, our friendship, when someone is alive. And that's my own rule. It's like, you know, you hear about people who are in gangs. And if a gang member gets shot, who's there at the funeral? It's the mother, it's the grandmother, it's the uncles. It's not the fellow gang members. Why? Well, they don't want to be associated with a gang member because the police are there, the reporters are there. So it's like they're friends. Like, you were his closest friend. Now, think, think how sad that is that Gatsby's closest friend was this guy who really wants no part of him, you know? And he was only using him to make money. It was just a business connection. So here's another denizen of Broadway, this sinister guy, and he pretends to be all sentimental. Call me sentimental and all of that stuff. And when I was young, things would have been different, but now, you know, you gotta, you gotta look out for yourself kind of thing. So. It's interesting that Fitzgerald, at the time, would not know that Arnold Rothstein would actually be assassinated. Um, but, you know, the type of life that they lead, whether it's 1919, 1925, or 2020, you know, you play this, you play this game. You can only play this game so long. Um, and what I was reading about Arnold Rothstein with, uh, in this thing called Infamous New York, is that you know he was always jealous of his older brother, um, and he was always a gambler, loved gambling, and would set up a racetrack at Harvard Grace uh, down in Maryland, not too far from uh, where I am here in Jersey, uh, would fix things, um, and just saw tons of opportunity to make boatloads of money with prohibition. Um, 
with people because they you know he gave them people what they wanted like that's why al capone was so popular he gave people what they wanted right booze all right so uh again read receptively but resistantly um let's not judge Fitzgerald too hard on perhaps the the stereotype of the uh the anti-semitism unless you want to um and he is a product of his time and uh this eugenics and the things that tom buchanan was saying about white nationalism that stuff was alive and well um in the upper echelons of business and politics so take care everyone bye bye yeah so you were listening to uh fast talking by kevin mcleod there as the backup music uh Impatech Film Music uh, Creative Commons license. Thank you.